All right. Today we are going to talk about the drop height determines neuromuscular adaptations and changes in jump performance and stretch shortening cycle training. Dude, this is a awesome and super heavy paper uh, from Wolfgang Tao. Uh, I highly recommend you read it. Uh, and man, there, there's a ton to take from it. So we're uh, really to do this right. We got to come about it a few different ways. So first things first, what did they do? Well, they did jump training for three times a week. Now, uh, it took 45 to 60 minutes. So if it three times a week for four weeks, it's 12 sessions. Each session was less than an hour. Uh, and that included a 10 minute warm up. There were two different jumping interventions. The first one, which is de uh, designated at SSC one, is where they did drop jumps from three heights, 30, 50, and 75 centimeters. Now what is significant about 75 centimeters is that uh, we'll see in another study by, by Tao, but honestly, we could look at it as uh, from Yuri Voroshansky, where he said, hey, 80 centimeters and above, that's, uh, 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 might have been, it was either 60 or 80 centimeters, I'm now questioning myself, I think it was 80, uh, centimeters and above is shock training, uh, it's shock method. And because it's pleometric, not plyometric, uh, I went into a long explanation of, on that from the uh, DeLeo uh, training podcast. Uh, but then, you know, that's, uh, that's something that's pretty interesting there. Uh, they would do 12 jumps for the 30 and 50 centimeter height. For the 75 centimeter height, they started low, 6, 8, 10, and 12, and increased from there. Uh, it wasn't exclusively the, the depth jump. Uh, the 30 and 50 were, were drop jump, 75 was depth jump. Uh, the uh, same number of jumps were done for the SSC2, but it was on, all their reps were only done from 30 centimeters. So now we look at the changes. Now we see that uh, SSC1, so the three drop heights, is over here on the left, and SSC2 is over here on the right. Now, whenever we look at rebound height now what is rebound height well in case you're not aware uh, a drop jump is whenever you step off of a box which were was one of the three heights that we mentioned before hit the ground and immediately jump up into the air now with the ssc1 we actually see that there was a significant difference in the rebound height and their jumping ability in all three conditions from the low height the medium height and the high height SSC2, we note that there's a trend. It was a positive trend, but it was just a trend. Now, if we look at the duration of the ground contact time, we see that uh, for the SSC1, there was not a, a, a positive trend, uh, excluding the high height. Now, this could be explained by, uh, oh, but if we look at the SSD2, excuse me, uh, we can see that there was actually a decrease in them. It wasn't significant, but it was decrease in the pattern followed across uh, all three conditions. Now, what is the difference? Well, we know that the acceleration of gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared. So essentially, the longer you spend in the air, the more force you're going to hit the ground with, the harder it's going to be to reverse it. Uh, it's just like if I wanted to... Uh, do an explosive, you know, uh, like, a, what do they call it, a, uh, whenever you would just drop down and, and snap back up with a squat, right, where you're basically rebounding out of the, the bottom. I'm, I'm trying to re reflexive firing isometric or something, an RFI, I believe, was what uh, somebody had denoted that as before. What is the true technical name, man? I don't know. Uh, but if I want to do that with 135, it's super easy. But what if I go up to six or 700 pounds? I'm going to be taking that down slow and controlled because I wouldn't be able to reverse that force. So with the smaller jump heights, we don't have as much force that we're having to reverse. So our ground contact time is going to be able to go down as a result of this style of training. And yeah, this is the stuff that we've seen in uh, the book from Shock Method by Yuri Verkoshansky and several of the studies. In fact, that's where I picked this study out from. Uh, but we see that the duration of ground contact time went up a little bit, not significantly. 
but for the short, uh, the SSC2 that only did the 30 centimeter group uh, time condition, they improved. Again, not significantly, but there was definitely a trend. This goes back to training specificity. So off the 30 centimeters, it's all about that drop jump. If you, you listen to the people who, who have uh, done a lot of the research on plyos, uh, especially the early research, that the point of the drop jump was to spend no time on the ground. The depth jump was about force and height. The drop jump was about getting off of the ground super fast. So what are we seeing? Well, we got off the ground super fast for here. Now, the conditions, let's talk about them briefly as far as uh, the adaptations would go. The 30 centimeter would be off the, getting off the ground fast, would be the drop vertical. Uh, the 50 centimeter turns into more of a force, and the 75 is definitely force where we're just worrying about the rebound height. Now, if we look at something called the performance index is what they noted it here, uh, and I don't think it's a, a great name for it, to, to be completely clear. Uh, I like having the same nomenclature uh, across everything. And if we look at the description of the performance index, as well as the calculation that's listed out here, it's jump height divided by uh, the milliseconds they spend on the ground. So jump height divided by contact time. Well, that's reactive strength index, and it has been for quite some time. Uh, this is the only real criticism I have of this paper. And to call that a, a, a criticism, I mean, that's a little bit of an understatement. You're allowed to call anything whatever you want. Now, with this, we had a, a pretty decent change but let's think about this why they're equal roughly equal in their changes how how is this even possible we see the significant jump height but no significant jump height a significant jump height increase for the ssc1 but not in, in two we see uh no significant differences in the ground contact time however whenever we have a decreased ground contact time with a trend towards increasing in jump height uh, that shows us how we could end up with a uh, improvement in the drop jump. The height didn't change, but the time spent on the ground did. Now, this is one of the reasons why I, well, not one of, this is the reason why I recommend for people that whenever you, if you're looking at RSI, look at everything. Don't just look at the RSI number, uh, because we can see here that uh, you could have two completely different methods of getting there and we're going to have uh, you know different adaptations that led us to it the increase in the jump height uh, versus the decrease in the contact time so uh, both of them can be independently trained now this h wave and m wave now what we're looking at is this is called the hoffman reflex so what they do is they put an e stem uh, on they they put it on typically like in the back of the knee in the popliteal region, and they hit it right. They uh, they do an electrical pulse, and that electrical pulse goes up the sensory uh, the A one efferent, the one A efferent, and then it hits that uh, presynaptic, uh, and switches over to the postsynaptic and comes back down to the muscle. So what we're looking at is what was the signal from the stem to the signal coming back with a muscular contraction. So uh, it, it's pretty cool stuff. Now the ratio of the H reflex, maximal amplitude, and maximum motor response reflects the percentage of motor neurons in the given pool that can be activated by the reflex afferents and can be used as an approximate measure of motor neuronal excitability. So this is how excitable uh, the, the muscle is. Now, if we look at, uh, we're going to continue back looking at the results. If we look at the HM, uh, H max, M max ratio, uh, we see that, hey, we're seeing favorable improvements. Uh, they're, they're small, but they're definitely uh, trending towards that excitability. Uh, we see in the SSC2 that, hey, we've got a pretty massive one, but it wasn't significant in the, uh, in the low height con uh, construct in that uh, 30 centimeter jumping condition. So what do we see? Specificity. They did a lot of repetitions here, so they accrued a lot of volume, so they're going to see that specific adaptation. The SSC1, while they trained everything, they didn't train any of them as much as the SSC2 did the 30 centimeter. So we're seeing a, a specificity there. 
Now, here's something that's pretty cool, and I want to stop and shift gears momentarily to talk about this. Everybody is always talking about stretch reflex, stretch reflex, stretch reflex. And without a, and the stretch reflex absolutely is a thing. But the stretch reflex, if it were everything to do with performance and human movement, if you missed a step or you thought there wasn't a step and there was one additional, we've all done that. And you, know, you stumble and uh, you look around, see if anybody watched you do something stupid like that. If it were all about the stretch reflex, we would hit the ground and it would be like nothing ever happened. We might turn around and look a step or two later and be like, oh, wow, well, that was funny. But that's not how it works. Now, the stretch reflex, according to this paper, is synonymous with that, uh, the, it's called a short latency response, or SLR. Now, we see that the SSC2, it dealt with that short latency response, uh, that it, the stretch reflex essentially was enhanced as a result of doing this low jumping. We see a greater activation, especially at that low height. Uh, the middle height is pretty good. The high height, eh, it's a little bit, but it, it's nowhere near the extent of the low and middle. Now, the long latency response. Now, this is indicative of uh, what your training is, the, dealing with the overcoming force and having to set pretension. So, and that muscular pretension is what allows us to have, you know, to actually get a good stretch. If I don't set enough pretension, then I am not going to be seeing a, a good subsequent jump. And really, they go into that in, in far greater depth in another paper that I'll, I'll make sure to post on this YouTube page. Now, here, we're looking at the, uh, the M wave uh, and, the, uh, and everything. So we see the soleus EMG, uh, and then the, that which is the bottom portion of the graph. Uh, and then the smoother line at the top, well, this is the ground reaction forces. So we see that, hey, yes, we did have an increase in the ground reaction forces. Uh, but whenever we look down here, we didn't see a significant change in the EMG until the long latency response. Okay. Now, uh, why there? Well, man, this is, uh, this is what we're having to overcome, right? This is the muscular action, the ability to overcome the force that the work that was done on you. Now, the short latency response, well, this is dealing more like in the stretch reflex, and we see that, hey, for that quick time, that 30 centimeter jump is great for it. Uh, the ground reaction forces did increase, and they increased in the short latency response period. Uh, and we see the AMG spike right here to, to go along with it, showing it's in that SLR. Now, if we look at the kinematics, this is pretty cool that we see the changes in the joint angle. They broke it down by the hip, knee, and the ankle. And for the low heights, we actually see an increase in joint angle for the hip, knee, and ankle. So they had a little bit more compliancy. Uh, with the hip and the medium height jumps, we saw no change and, uh, for the medium and uh, no change, essentially, really a slight decrease, very, very slight decrease for the, uh, in the high uh, high height condition uh, for the hip. If we go down to the knee, uh, we see that we had a increase in the number of joint angle, uh, the number, the amount of angle, the uh, amplitude of angle, uh, seeing an increase to almost four degrees. And then at the high height, the knee, we see basically no change. And then the ankle. It's pretty interesting. We see all three conditions had improvements. Uh, well, improvements depending on how you're looking at it. Had increases in joint range of motion. So that's all pretty cool. Now, what is it saying? Well, essentially what it's saying is that I'm actually going to increase some compliancy as a result of this training. Now, this is the changes in ankle joint stiffness and how it related uh, to the changes in the HM ratio. Uh, so for the soleus. Really, we're going to need to do a whole different video about this because I don't want to spend another 15 minutes talking about it. So let's get to the conclusions. The decision whether to apply SSC1 
with uh, you know greater heuristics, I guess you would call it, with the uh, 30, 50, and 75 centimeter, or the SSC2, all 30 centimeter, is dependent on the specific demands of the particular sport dis uh, discipline. What does the person need, even beyond that? Uh, is it that they can't reverse force quickly? Well, then you're going to look at the drop jump. Is it that they're having to overcome a massive amplitude of force? Well, then we're going to want to look at the depth jump, that 75 centimeter condition. High drop height should be implemented into the training regime if the goal is to maximize the rebound height. Right? If you wanted to uh, be able to just jump as high as possible and ground contact time is not a limiting factor, do, those, uh, do the depth jumps. Low drop height should be preferred to maximize power output and time critical discipline, disciplines. So whenever you don't have much time, whenever it's just getting off the ground super quick, that's going to be the low drop height. The high height is whenever you're having to, you're looking for massive force stimulus. Now the enhanced rebound heights following SSC1 training cannot be explained by alterations of the early stretch reflex components. Uh, so that's not the only thing that happened. There is some additional uh, muscle force. Also, the increased jump height cannot be attributed to an enhanced ankle joint stiffness in the eccentric phase because it didn't. We had an increase in compliancy. So if we have a greater uh, number of degrees that we dip, well, let's think about this. If we look at the research that's out there looking at lower limb stiffness, it is force concentric force divided by the counter movement depth. So if I'm actually going lower, then I'm decreasing stiffness. Now, I will also say this, that if all of the conditions, all of the uh, jump, ex excuse me, were done in the high height condition, I think that the jump, uh, the, uh, the joint stiffness in the ankle would have actually increased because of the need to withstand that force. Uh, versus the compliancy increase that we saw as a result of it. So again, it comes back to specificity of training. Do I want more or less range of motion of the joint? If I want more, like say in the early off season, I am going to be doing uh, the jumps and spinning, you know, uh, like uh, the, the 30 centimeter jump uh, and increasing my range of motion. Any of my jumps, I'm going to be looking for that increased range of motion. Uh, if the if it's time for time to go and time time to ramp up stiffness, then I'm going to be looking to do more of those high height jumps. Therefore, in activities where the jump height is most important, the depth jumps are warranted. While uh, activities of the speed of jumping and reduced ground, ground contact time is imperative, uh, it would be better trained using the repetitive jumps or the drop jumps, uh, hitting down to the ground. Okay, so that's going to be it for this study today. Uh, hey, this is a great study. You know, in fact, in an upcoming uh, uh, coaches education course, we go over this and actually, you know, uh, a couple of hours worth of studies uh, dealing with plyometrics and, and how to train uh, and the like. If you like information like this and you think that it would help you be a better coach, Come visit us at the U. And we've got an undergraduate program for those. If you're a coach already, hey, man, I'm sorry. Uh, coming back and getting another bachelor's degree probably isn't in the cards for you. Uh, but if you're an undergraduate who's wanting, knows that they want to go into be a strength and conditioning coach. How many people know that? Dude, I knew it at 13 that I wanted to be involved in this industry. And here I am, 41, 28 years later, you know, still living the dream. Come visit us at the U here. Uh, we've got an undergraduate exercise physiology program, kinesiology and sports sciences that, uh, that is fantastic. Uh, Top-notch faculty all around. You know, Arlette Perry, Kevin Jacobson, uh, uh, Joe Signorelli, uh, Wes Smith, the, the, the list, uh, Brian Orwari. The list goes on and on and on of the fantastic professors. If you've got your bachelor's degree, and then he decided that, hey, I want to go into strength and conditioning, and I feel like I need an education to do this, come see us here because we've got a master's program in applied physiology with the strength and conditioning track. Or maybe you are a strength and conditioning coach now, and you're like, man, I want to get some more education. What do I do? Where do I go? Well, I was that guy. Everybody thinks that all of my degrees were in exercise physiology, and they weren't. I'm self-taught at this stuff. So uh, 
I'm hoping to be able to help you. And we are having coaches education courses that will be going live uh, probably in January or February uh, that will be available for NSCA CEUs. And, uh, and we'll have different topics. We'll have one that's an eight-week course where you get to work you know, side by side virtually with me, uh, trying to help walk you through and, and get you ready to go. Uh, and we'll also eventually have some coaches education courses up that I, I call choose your own adventure is that uh, we everybody has got different topics that they may already be strong in and they don't want to have to sit through more on that. Uh, so we're putting together stuff that you can improve what you're weak on. So uh, long story short, if you like this kind of information, come down here and join us at the U.